Hello and welcome once again. Thank you for returning. Or if you're new to this channel, thank you for watching. I don't pay much attention to the YouTube statistics or analytics as they refer to them, but more to the uh, encouraging comments and the emails I receive, which are supportive and give me better feedback in they represent your interest in the Dharma and that many of you have been returning to listen to these talks, discuss with each other and also throw comments my way for me to talk about on a regular basis. And in uh, just two years, there are now more than 13,000 subscribers. So for a channel that isn't specifically commercial or gaining or aiming to gain advantage in the marketplace in any way, but simply to be here as a, as a by way of service on my part, that is still quite, I think, encouraging. So thank you for subscribing and for coming back. And it is those all important comments and emails that give both me something to talk about, albeit I can usually find some subject matter, especially within the Dharma, but also keep the topics in line with your own practice and experience. So with that in mind, we'll go on to the uh, first comment. Let me just read this quick, easy one here before I get into something more complicated. Uh, do you find it hard to go to sleep? And where do you go to sleep? So no, I don't find it hard to go to sleep because I go to sleep relatively not too early and get up very early. And uh, well, no, I just don't have any problems going to sleep. I'm not sure why you ask. And where do you go to sleep? Just here on the floor. Uh, I roll, wrap my robe around me and lay on the floor just there. Use my sangati, which is my outer robe there, as something to rest my head on. Now, the next, uh, the first main point to talk about. I wonder if you could reflect and give a talk on boundaries. So I'm not sure I can give a whole talk or reflect on boundaries, as I'm not really sure from that opening line exactly what that refers to, but I'm sure you're going to go on to explain. Let's see. Uh, how you protect the Dharma in you, the space you live, and how you detach and depossess in Buddhism. So, you protect the Dharma in you. The Dharma just really means the, the teachings of the Buddha the truth, in its uh, holistic sense. And once that is understood, you know it is supported, and in your words, protected, therefore, by sila, keeping the precepts. So in my case, 227 monastic rules, in yours, if you're lay people, either five precepts or eight precepts. So how you protect the Dharma in you and the space you live in is by keeping the precepts. That's the first category which forms the Noble Eightfold Path. Sila, Samadhi, Panya. Sila, moral virtue. Pan Samadhi, meditation. And Panya, its wisdom, comprises the rest of the Noble Eightfold Path. So how do you detach and depossess in Buddhism? Protecting the space you live in. I'm not sure I quite understand, but by the practice of that Noble Eightfold Path in its entirety, so keeping the precepts, practicing meditation, you'll develop wisdom. 
whatever's going on around you in your surroundings, whether you're in a, a place like this or in the middle of a city, it, living in lay life, it's all of, of, all of as a result of the causes and conditions you've put in place yourself previously. However, wherever you may be, whatever it is you're facing, it makes no odds. If you like what your situation is, you have desire, you're liking it. If you don't like it, you will have aversion to it, you're not liking it, which sounds obvious, but it is whether you're liking or not liking which is where the issue lies, not the scenario itself that you are surrounded by. So we learn in the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path to develop this third aspect of Panya, wisdom, understanding all things are impermanent, unsatisfactory and out of our control. And in each and every one of these talks and videos, I mention that time and time and time again, because it is the answer to most of these questions. What you're asking me here is, what is the practice? Well, that is the practice, the Noble Eightfold Path. There is no variation on that. So how do I protect the Dharma in me and the space I live in and dispossess in Buddhism? So I would imagine become, you mean by that, um, becoming uh, disenchanted, the word we use is disenchanted, with perhaps worldly life, things that are going on, like going to the cinema, going to the restaurant, listening to music, having relationships, eating fine foods at all times of day. Becoming detached from that is a result of practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. So could you also consider the difference of, oh, it's gone. Could you also consider the, the difference of that in the Western traditions, such as Christianity, and that seems much more forceful in casting out, rather than my experience in Buddhism, in that things will naturally leave or not be attracted to you, or you leave a place in a peaceful fashion. So I'm not really sure about... So the difference clearly is in Christianity, it's a theistic religion relying on a God and really blaming God for everything. Pray to God enough and he'll take all the problems away, which is clearly not the result. Um, in Buddhism, we don't have to believe in anything uh, and we just see things for as they are. This is the difference. Uh, so I'm not sure I understand fully the comment there. There is a story about monks having trouble meditating in a place. Uh, I've forgotten the name of the place because of the spirits that live there, the monks. Uh, so this is the um, um, story behind the Mangala. Um, oh, is it the Ratana Sutta? The three core suttas, the, uh, the Mangala, Ratana and Karyana Metta Sutta. The Ratana Sutta is what we call a Purita, one of the protective chants. The uh, Buddha recommended that uh, they just go into back into the forest and they can chant um, any of these suttas, or uh, chant these paritas, and it will allay their fears and also allay the fears of the spirits that uh, lived there, whom would realize that these monks were of no, going to cause them no harm. So in other words, you could sum that also up by, you go back into the forest, monks, don't be afraid of the ghosts or the wild animals or anything like that, because uh, if you're behaving yourself, if you're keeping a base of moral virtue, you're keeping the precepts, causing no harm, then you ultimately are going to be leaving that place, as you said, towards the end of your last, the part of the last comment, leave that place in a peaceful fashion, you're not disturbing the environment around you. You, as I've spoken of many times before, trying to cause as little impact as possible by being somewhere other than what you can add positively to the surrounding environment. So for me, I go on Pindapata in the morning, arms around, not just to get food, but because people want me to do that. They want to see a monk going and collecting arms and receiving blessings from the Sangha 
and offering dana to the Sangha. That's enough. They don't want to see monks around in the afternoon, hanging around shops, bars, begging, or doing any of these things which are way outside of the rules and we would be breaking our precepts and outside of the Vinaya uh, standards. So, um, in terms of our requirements, they are very little, li living this simple life. And th really, this is in, I can't remember the name of the, the sutta, um, or even specifically, I'm sure it's the Mangala Sutta, which is the 32 blessed things that we can do by living in a suitable place, practicing well, and all of this thing. I chant it every other morning or something like that. Um, we uh, follow the Noble Eightfold Path and then we're doing no harm to ourselves or to others, and others will wish less harm upon us. So I'm sorry if I didn't give your full comment, full justice there. I didn't quite get the, the question. Right. Uh, after that lizard Talagoya grows, it's going to look at preying on the cat. So you're referring to the um, water monitor. I've forgotten what they're called here in Sri Lanka. Not that word. There's another word they call them. Um, yeah, they have been known. I knew someone who had kittens and the, one of the kittens was taken by one of those larger versions of those water monitors. Uh, this, this cat's fairly safe around here. It's uh, been here for, it's an old cat, been here for many years. And uh, yeah, they know what they're doing. We leave nature alone to deal with it itself. Nature is, when you're watching nature, when you're living in nature, you could become quite horrified. I even have moments where I try to rescue something that maybe the cat is playing with, which does result usually in it killing it. It doesn't seem necessarily always for food. It seems to be a game. And if it's a baby rat or a lizard or something like that, so the other way around, and the cat's uh, fooling around with it, it's uh, rather horrid, which is why I give it some food, give the cat some food to try and prevent this, these goings on. But after all, this is just nature. And we're fortunate to be born in the human realm where mostly, not always, we are living by certain standards and we, we don't go out killing for just killing sake. And uh, it is not so. So it is the human realm where we have the opportunity to come to understand the Dharma and to progress further from that. In the animal realm, very difficult, of course, if you're killing willy-nilly, so to speak. Okay, sometimes you say that there is no rebirth according to Buddha, and sometimes you say the cat is reborn and would have practiced Buddhist culture in previous lives. Please clarify. Well, I'm very happy to hear you've obviously listened to many of my videos to pick up those little comments are rather out of context in varying different times and places where I've been staying over the last couple of years. So I've never said the Buddha says there is no rebirth because rebirth is a fundamental part of right view and its understanding the fundamental basis for Buddhism. So I would never say the Buddha said there's no rebirth. What I have said is we don't in Buddhism call it reincarnation, which is something entirely different. Reincarnation is uh, understood to be this personality, um, of course this self, which Buddhism teaches there is no self, there is no personality, just a result of causes and conditions put in place. Reincarnation is that, this fictional idea of a self or a personality, coming to life again in another form, but still having the qualities of what you might refer to as a soul, even memory. We don't, the Buddha does not refer to that uh, and only 
refers to rebirth, which I've spoken of many times also. So look back on some of those videos. Uh, with regards to the cat, um, we have all been, we've been born into this life. So we've lived previously and in any manner of forms, whether it be in the animal realms, heavenly realms, we cannot know this until we have recall of this. We can remember uh, previous lives, which can be attained during deep states of meditation and highly attained levels uh, of developing towards enlightenment. But even without that, we're born with some likes and dislikes, some skills which seem to be inherent within us that aren't taught but known and just picked up easily. Some people are good at something and not so good at other things, whereas others are the reverse. Uh, it is almost a kind of evidence that we have lived in a previous life to have perfect, perfected and developed those qualities or those skills. But even without that confirmation, without that evidence, you can still accept that you have been born here, now, in this life. And what happens from here and now, in this present moment, is what should depend, is what the next moment is dependent on, on what determines the future, the causes and conditions you are putting in place now with a foundation of moral virtue and good practice of meditation and wholesome states of mind are what will cause the next moment to be as it will be. They will assist in that progression through within this life. So each moment in effect is a rebirth. And it's simply just the case that when the body dies, this physical body stops working and the thinking brain stops, then it's just another moment. And what continues is the momentum of those actions we call karma uh, into rebirth, not reincarnation. So with none of the inherent qualities of culture, language, personality, anything we hold to be a self or a view, personality view in the Pali Sakaya Ditti. There is anatta, no self. So the three characteristics of existence are anicca, impermanence, dukkha, suffering, and anatta, not self. In other words, everything's changing, it's unsatisfactory, and it's out of our control. If we think it's within our control, we try to control it, then we're really banging our head, uh, head against a stone wall. Uh, we cannot do that. We cannot control the growth rate of our hair. We cannot control the uh, decaying of our body as we age, get sick and we die. These aspects are all out of our control, albeit with avijja, a lack of understanding or ignorance, we believe, often it is believed that this body and this personality these skills, this intellectual knowledge is all ours. It's a possession that we can take forward. That would be reincarnation and that doesn't have any place in Buddhism. <clears throat> I have a... This is lots of questions. I'm going to go through them quickly. I have a question and then it's followed by about 10. I have a question. What is a typical day for you? So I wake up at 3 a.m., meditate. Chanting, meditation, blessings at 6 a.m., which is a very short version live on YouTube where you can join me. And I'm very comforted to have you join me each morning doing that. Uh, at 6.30, I go on Pindapata, arm round, arms round to collect my food, returning here by 7.30, where I get everything ready, sort out the food that's going to be distributed among other people, because I have way too more than I need for myself. I eat at 8. I'm normally finished by... Sometimes at that time, people come with further offerings of dana, so I'll speak to them for a while, followed by which I have my one meal of the day from my Pindabhata bowl, in which it's been collected during the arms round of the Pindabhata in the morning. After which, I wash up my bowl, and if there's any laundry to do, like wash my robe or something like that, or it's the day when I shave my head and things, 
I do that, hang those things up to dry, and then usually by about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, I'm able to sit down and talk to you like this, or listen to some Dharma myself, read some Dharma, or to practice. But there on, for the rest of the day, my day is free. Free to practice sitting, meditation, walking, meditation. That is not walking anywhere, just walking up and down. Although I don't do so much of that myself, I prefer sitting in samadhi for nice three hour sessions. Then with perhaps a break, where I'll just stretch my legs walking around outside a little and uh, maybe have some water or even a cup of tea in the afternoon. Usually around three, I have a cup of tea, uh, around six o'clock, maybe someone might visit, maybe not, but it's getting dark then, so the candles are lit, the incense are lit again. I don't usually do an evening puja also, but I'll sit and continue then with my night's practice until such a time comes as to go to sleep. And that's it about my day. Then do you sleep unconscious? I'm not sure what you mean. As far as I'm aware, we're all, um, well, as in my experience, uh, when you're asleep, you are asleep. That is, it is you are unconscious. You are unable to practice sati, mindfulness, whilst you're asleep. It's, uh, if you've been practicing well all day and previous days and for a long time, you will sleep soundly, peacefully, dreamlessly. I really don't ever dream these days and your sleep is very uh, restorative. Then it's uh, 3 o'clock, 3 a.m., I wake up again and it all starts, begins again. Do you divide your night into unconscious rest and meditation? If you're referring to when I go to sleep and wake up again, it's just sleep. Sleep is just that. Uh, my day is divided into three-hour meditation sessions. And um, I'm not sure what unconscious rest means. Do you have a certain time for different parts of the Noble Eightfold Path? No, you're practicing the Noble Eightfold Path continuously. I try to practice the Noble Eightfold Path continuously. And the point of these videos is to be able to, to some extent, share with you that experience and hopefully be of benefit to others looking to keep the moral precepts, practice meditation and develop wisdom. It isn't something that is to be divided up and done at certain parts of the day. Because when you're practicing keeping sila, it's enabling you to meditate. When you're meditating, it's developing wholesome mind states or wisdom. If you're referring to spending time reading a book and learning intellectually something, I don't really do that anyway, but that's still developing wisdom with mindfulness, so you're practicing sati, part of the Noble Eightfold Path, and you'd still be keeping precepts whilst you're doing that. So it all goes together. Do you journal? No, I don't. Or what do you do if or when you reach a plateau in your development? I'm not sure what that means. You, you, Oh, do you have, for an example, of a time where there was an achievement that you were able to attain through strategic planning? No, I, I don't have any form of strategic planning for anything. Um, and uh, we don't talk of our own attainments. It's more important that you investigate your own practice and your own attainments. As far as reaching a plateau is concerned, we're ultimately looking to become free from suffering in this lifetime. So the complete eradication of greed, hatred and delusion. This is attaining to Arahant, uh, the, the enlightened stage of Arahant, going through the stages of uh, Sotapanna or stream entry, um, Anagami, Satanagami and Arahant, the four stages of enlightenment slowly cutting away the fetters, the ties to rebirth, to samsara, uh, in each of those stages. Don't worry too much about the stages. I mean, the first stage, you have a total and utter confidence or understanding, knowledge of the truth, being the Four Noble Truths. You have abandoned Sakaya Ditti, personality view, as I was just talking about. You have no 
need for rites and rituals other than to further your mindfulness and develop faith in the practice of what the Buddha taught us and how to achieve enlightenment, but not rites and rituals by way of prayer and worship, trying to invoke powers, trying to seek assistance externally, trying to get an external or higher power or God to assist in your development or helping with problems, solve problems. This is rites and rituals, a complete abandonment and distrust of such activities, just not having any place for those. This is just the first stage of enlightenment, followed by the slow, gradually um, decreasing sensual desire as well as the decreasing of aversion. So the decreasing of greed, decreasing of greed the decreasing of hatred. Ultimately, they will be completely removed when these defilements are gone. Uh, and finally, anger. So comes as part of sort of aversion, but a little bit more complex. And conceit, that is a personality view, whereby you consider yourself either worse than, equal to, or better than another. When you really have no personality view, you've abandoned Sakaya Ditti. Conceit also is reduced, is, er is eroded, but eventually will have to be finally gone when you've attained to arahantship. And that would be considered, if you're referring to here, a plateau of uh, the practice. In the interim period, you will have good days, bad days, days where your meditation goes really well. But what is well? Um, if it's just you are sitting in peaceful, blissful, joyful, tranquil states, it isn't necessarily helping you to develop much in the way of insight or wisdom. Whereas if you really struggle in a difficult environment with lots of feelings physically and emotionally arising and passing away, you will develop more wisdom, developing insight into the goings on that can be all seen within this fathom length body. These physical feelings and these mental emotions as they arise and pass away. This is developing clear seeing or vipassana from samadhi uh, meditation. This, these are all beneficial and ultimately what result in becoming free from suffering in this lifetime. So it is a slowly progressing nature of things, not a strict step by step. And once you reach one plateau, you go up to the next. It's not like that. The strategy, if you need one, is the Noble Eightfold Path once again. So, my question is, I'd love to know where to find resources to learn more about Buddhism as a beginner. So, the, the suttas here, watch this channel, just watch this channel, yeah? And um, other, if you have other Dharma channels, you can listen to Dharma talks on that uh, grab your attention, give them a go. But, the, book, the word of the Buddha is the suttas, really, is the uh, Sutta Pitaka. And this is what you should read, which can be summed up in the chanting, a lot of the chanting book, a lot of it can be summed up in there for a beginner, that is, for starting. Uh, forget the fact it's chanting, it's just a verse version of the teachings, reflections of the Buddha. Uh, there's one good book called, well, there's many, many millions of good books you could read, but don't spend your time reading. Like I just said, learn from sitting in samadhi from your body and your mind what's going on. That's what you should be doing as a beginner, meditating. So listen to some Dharma talks and practice. Practice the Noble Eightfold Path. Otherwise, you're just going to spend your time going from one book to another, to one channel to another, to one website to another. Get the fundamental basics from the chanting book, which contains all the relevant reflections and basic practices that we are carrying out on a daily, day, as our day-to-day -day activities, if you like. Um, then you've given me a, long, a context of what you have been doing, which I'm not going to read out. I did read it before, but I won't read it out again now. So um, hopefully that's in line with what you have been doing. And Bante... Uh, Niana Tiloka, who was a German monk, actually lived here in Sri Lanka, wrote a book a long time ago now, so it's slightly old English, called The Word of the Buddha. 
and that is uh, one of the foremost and it's a very old book and it's still around it's available on Google you can look it up find out how to get hold of a copy and that is a very good summary of the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path but saying that so is the Pavatana Dhammachaka Sutta uh, which can be found in the chanting book and read but not only read and studied and learned but actually put into practice done you do it you don't just read about it so get away from this idea of learning to be a Buddhist you actually have to be a Buddhist you have to practice that's what it's about email me if I can be of any more help directly for it to you though Oh, there's a second part to this question. So you already agree with the Google searches. You want some more in-depth. Well, the in-depth side of it. And you, uh, yeah, the in-depth side of it really comes from, from the practice, sitting and practicing meditation. You don't need to, there are, uh, in, there are and have been many illiterate Arahant monks, so fully attained, which I was just talking about, Arahants, fully enlightened monks and nuns who never read, could not read, didn't pass, learn to read in school in the past. They learned, they became arahants not through learning but by, by through practicing. Now it is useful to study and read, especially in this day and age whereby we have access to such good resources, but be very careful about doing too much of that. And what you're saying there usually is <clears throat> what do people usually learn from well like I've just said that's that that you a lot of people do spend most of their life just reading about it rather than doing it like reading the menu and not ever ordering the food or reading a cookbook or book and never going into the kitchen what you need to do is go into the kitchen or order the food get on with it that's what you need to do uh, would I be able to talk about exactly how I meditate or is there already a video on this on your channel? So how I sit, yes there is one. Um, there are a couple of guided meditations but I've not done very many of those. That's not necessarily how I meditate. Uh, is it just concentrating? Um, and then you say, is it just concentration on breath? Or do you recommend repeating words like pain, pain, if you feel pain, or worry, worry, etc. So I don't use this noting technique continually of what thoughts are arising. As far as what I do in my own practice is I began uh, my meditation practice from listening to and understanding the Anapanasati Sutta, the Buddha's words directly to us they're also in the chanting book as well as the suttas of observation of the breath so Anapanasati Sutta is where um, he teaches his bhikkhus to meditate with mindfulness of the breath just watching the breath as it comes in and watching the breath as it goes out now you will find as your practice develops with time and you attain to certain levels of absorption, we call jhanas, that your own mind and body will adapt its own way, not a technique, but its own way of just settling in to meditation, much like when you go to sleep at night. Uh, some people might start off having to count sheep, for example, but eventually will hopefully not have to count sheep and just go to sleep. So you are always able to come back to the breath as a very central part of your mindfulness practice as a meditation object. And it can be employed as a useful tool throughout all of your daily activities, whatever situation you may be in. And I do use that continually, bringing my attention back to the breath as I breathe in through my nose and noticing is it short, is it long, but not noting, not saying the word in my head. Uh, verbally in my mind, not repeating with that noting technique. I find that's um, a mantra which is distracting
because it requires a decision making process as to what are you going to say? What word am I going to use for this? You're thinking. It is better if you need a word, a mantra to get your mind to hold on to something to use a simple two syllable word or however many symbol, syllables is suitable for you. But in Thailand they use this buto, which is Buddha, budo, um, pronounced buto, buto, buto. And they use this continually in their mind, repeated, as a mantra to have something to hold on to. But this is only really if the mind is very overactive and also can be employed during all of your daily activities, whatever you're doing. Unless you're required to be really thinking about something and doing some concentrated work, and then you just do that carefully and, and diligently as possible until you get a break. And then you may relax by sitting saying, budo, 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 budo. But I don't practice myself this noting aspect of saying pain, pain, worry, worry, because it, it requires a decision as to what, what, what you're observing. It's also considered useful because it's giving you insight as to what is going on by labeling it. But my question there, my question is, well, don't you already know? Why, why do you have to, you're not having to tell someone else. So why are you telling yourself? You, you, it's happened. To say the word, you've already experienced. It's gone. It's past. And we're trying to be in this present moment, here and now. So remembering that, you've only got this present moment, here and now. And any thought about the past moment, bringing it into this moment, is only continuing that into the next moment. So we try to be just here, and the breath is a very useful way to do that. So, in answer to your question, how do I meditate? The same way as the Buddha meditated when he became enlightened, using the Anapanasati uh, type of meditation. I'm carefully not saying technique or um, method, because it isn't so much that, but a knowledge of, a way of being mindful. Uh, of what's going on, of the truth. It isn't a um, something to be found in an instruction book or method you have to follow. Once somebody says to you, just sit down and watch the breath and do nothing else, that's it. That's all you need to do. And uh, when you find yourself not doing that, you will eventually hopefully remember or remind yourself, but once you remember you're not doing that, or realize you're not doing that, you come back to doing that. You don't bring yourself back, you don't remind yourself to come back, because again, once again, it's already happened. The thought's there. You've realized you're not watching the breath anymore. Immediately you're back to watching the breath, back into the present moment, here and now, within the body. And I think I've answered, because at the end of here you say, do you recommend applying this to your everyday? So when washing the dishes, say washing, washing, and so on. No, I, I, you don't need to be saying washing, washing, when you're washing the dishes. You know you're washing the dishes. So you can actually, when you're doing something, a mundane task like cleaning, doing your laundry, washing the dishes, sweeping the floor, you could be uh, really just watching the breath or saying buto, buto, buto. Keeping the mind as clear as possible still able to do the job in hand carefully, diligently and well, but without, you don't need to be repeating, washing, washing, sweeping, sweeping. That's totally unnecessary. <clears throat> I'd like to hear your view on Soto Zen Buddhism. I re read a book about it recently and it sounded rather harsh and not very peaceful for the individual. So I don't really have a view on Zoto Zen Buddhism because I don't know anything about much about it. However, they're mainly, as I understand, meditation orientated. It's a jhana practice. In fact, Zen comes from Chan and Chan comes from jhana. Um, Zen being the, the Japanese word for Chan being the Chinese word for jhana. And jhana is deeply absorbed meditation. So Zen is very much about jhana meditation. And it might sound harsh because 
it is harsh if you want to develop jhanas. It's only in harsh in as such as you just have to sit there and do nothing for a long time. And a lot of people find that very difficult to do. So for a few minutes, let alone hours. So um, that's, I don't know what book you read or why it was particularly harsh. You hear all sorts of stories of Zen masters hitting people over the head with sticks and this and that, or having to stare at a wall for hours on end. Well, you know, this isn't anything you have to do, is it? Um, as you don't have to read those books. If you just sit, practice meditation, and you've been keeping precepts, then everything else will follow. And this we call Buddhist practice. Whether you want to call it Theravada, Mahayana, Tibetan, Zen, that's by the by. What you're doing is practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. Anything outside of the uh, parameters of the Noble Eightfold Path uh, is that. It's external. It's nothing to do with the practice of what the Buddha has given us in his teachings in the word of the Buddha, in the Four Noble Truths, which contains the Noble Eightfold Path. Suffering, cause of suffering, end of suffering, and the path leading to the end of suffering. And this is all described beautifully in the Dhammachaka Sutta. So just read through that again, just do that. That's your Buddhism, that's your practice. <clears throat> Isn't identification with Buddhism an attachment, like an ego's way of prolonging itself and feel special. So possibly I just answered that in the last question, didn't I? It's not identification with Buddhism, it's practicing Buddhism. And what is practicing Buddhism? It's keeping five precepts. Uh, that's got nothing to do with self or ego. It's just doing no harm. You could sum up the five precepts in one, do no harm. So we're not killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying or taking intoxicants so as we're not going to harm ourselves or any other beings around us or anywhere. So uh, that is uh, the foundation of the practice. Then there is meditation, which is in solitude. You meditate alone. You may be meditating within a group for a little bit of extra encouragement and support, but you're not relying on them. It's not a team practice. To me, I find that rather um, unnecessary, a little, well, it's not distracting because they normally hold group meditations in a nice, quiet, undisturbed, ambient environment. So it's a good place, a good place to practice. But it's not necessary if you can, can meditate alone. Uh, meditation is a, so therefore the idea of self and ego, which is usually where you, you, you describe it as feeling special is neither here nor there. It's, it's irrelevant, isn't it? There's nobody here to think I'm special. Um, uh, I suppose there's you, but I'm not special. I'm just doing what monks do. <laughs> um, so Buddhism isn't really that much of an identification in any respect because, of course, it's also developing anatta the understanding of anatta, not self, that there is no self and it's just a result of causes and conditions we have put in place. It's not that Buddhism has put those causes and conditions in place, it's our own actions of body, speech and mind that have done that. And if they're within the parameters of the Noble Eightfold Path, so moral virtue, and you've practiced meditation, you would have developed wisdom uh, within, that, within that practice. Oh, and then it goes on to a bit of a string, but we won't go there. Oh, another one. How does not having money fit in with the middle path? Isn't that like an attachment to poverty or another way ego prolongs itself and feels special? So there's a sort of an underlying theme of these uh, questions. So give it a go. Uh, get, a, get rid of all your money and see how special you feel. Uh, if it... Uh, prolongs your ego. I think you'll find it's actually quite difficult at first, but you get used to it. Um, but it's not an attachment uh, to poverty. I don't think there are many monks who you could say are living in poverty, but we are living dependent on others, which means we maintain this interdependence of the Sangha 
and the lay people that support it. So the lay people require the Sangha to support them in their practice of the Noble Eightfold Path, their bhavana, their mental development. And the Sangha need the lay people in order to finance their ability to be monks, have a monastery or somewhere to live, but only in the most simplest of forms. So shelter, clothing, so food, clo it's in this order usually, food, clothing, shelter, medicine, of the most basic uh, forms uh, that, that to keep us going. As you see, I live in basic shelter, um, very simple, without any accoutrements or add-ons, simple robes, eat once a day, simple food that's offered, whatever it may be, and the medicines are as basic as they can be in this day and age. So, um, I wouldn't say, it, how does it fit in with the middle path? Well, the middle path was coming from, that expression comes from having the Buddha having practiced severely ascetic practices for six years. And prior to that, lived a very luxurious life. So the two extremes. And he found somewhere in between. Now that somewhere in between is very different uh, depending on your culture. So for how I'm living here, in this situation now, the view of my folks back where I come from is that I'm living in a very difficult situation. It's quite harsh and, you know, very old way of living, not very good at all. And they think it's rather ascetic. But for many people in within this, uh, this country itself and within uh, poorer countries, um, this is quite a luxurious existence. So we find somewhere in between. So it's, um, it's got no relation really to uh, whether or not one is... Um, it's not not having money, it's not using money. We have no... We're taking away that choice, that decision making aspect. The, the, the order of the precept is that it's not to handle gold or silver because that was the money of the time. So if I decided that uh, these robes were full of holes, which they wouldn't be because we have rules to make sure we keep mending them, I can't just go out and buy new robes. I have to wait for them to be offered to me. Um, so I have to just sit down and mend them and keep them as best as I can until that happens. Um, so that's the point of no money. Offerings from Buddhists, isn't that superstition? I wouldn't say so. I think if someone's offering me some food by putting a little bit of food in my bowl, uh, they're doing that, or it should be the case, that they're doing that in order that I can survive for another day to practice so that I don't starve because that's the only source of food I have. Now, if they believe that it's going to bring them good luck, pass their exams, driving test, or find them a good husband or wife or make them live for a long time or have a happy rebirth, then, you know, that's up to them. But that shouldn't be um, the intention. The intention behind giving uh, offerings from Buddhists to monks um, or to anyone is to practice generosity, dana, which makes us feel good, doesn't it? So if you give someone a Christmas present, it's not superstitious, is it? It's because you want to give that person a Christmas present. And in a Buddhist country, people want to give you, put some food or something nice in your bowl for you to eat, uh, because it's like the same as when you give a birthday present or a Christmas present to someone, uh, wherever you might be. So, uh, yeah, so it's not superstition at all. I mean, everything can be made superstitious, can't it? Everyone can have their own opinions. Right. And I think I've answered that one already, so...
Can we meditate to mantra music? Um, I wouldn't know. I mean, this, this is listening to mantra music. We in the Eighth Precept aren't allowed to listen to music, whatever you call it. Chanting is for chanting purposes. We can listen to that, but usually we're doing that, but we can listen to it also. But meditation is meditation. So, yeah, there's many meditation videos online with lots of pretty bells and music, mantra music in the background. That's not the meditation the Buddha taught. He, he didn't have this or recommend this. Watching the breath and all that arises in the mind and in the body is what we do. So, um, you can do whatever you like, but it's not what I recommend if you want to attain to any levels of absorption. You may, with repetitive tunes and music, get into a form of trance. Uh, they even have this music in the modern, well it's probably not so modern now, they used to have music called trance music, where people would be like, I'm not going to do any sort of dancing here, but um, dancing away and get into a kind of hypnotic trance with the rhythm and the beat and the music and it can really be attributed to that kind of a, a nature but then what happens when the music stops like that it's gone now the development of jhana of samadhi is such that you are not requirement required to have any external sources to enable you to attain to those deep levels of absorption. In fact, you will be cut off from seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and eventually even thinking. Uh, albeit very awake, fully conscious and aware, those noises, sounds, uh, sights, smells, feelings, and intrusive thoughts will not affect your equanimity, your calmness, your peace, your tranquility. You will be removed, protected, sheltered from those. So you don't want to introduce into your meditation additional distraction to focus on other than what can be self-generated within, maybe by just simply saying Bhutto, Bhutto, Bhutto. But most uh, useful is watching the breath. And on that note, I think it's probably time I should leave it there. Once again, thank you for watching. Until next time, be happy and stay well. Suki Hotu.